So I want to talk a little bit today about some tips that are going to be a little bit more specific for livestock producers. So today I'm going to talk about biosecurity for small farms. What is biosecurity? Biosecurity is a series of management practices designed to prevent the introduction or spread of disease agents on an animal production facility. Right. So we've all heard the old expression, right, that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And let's think about it a minute. Here are some examples of on a cattle farm, but we could use just slightly different numbers and measure the economic impacts on any type of livestock farm. But on a cattle farm, if you lose one calf to a disease, right, let's just say the calf weighed 600 pounds. Let's say the current market price was $1.40. That's almost $900, right, that you've lost. Or what if the calves don't die? What if you have five calves that get sick and then recover, but they end up selling 100 pounds lighter than they should have, right? You're still, that's $700 that's lost. Right? And that's not to mention the cost of antibiotics, right? So I spent many years in practice, right? So in practice, I went from farm to farm treating sick animals, right? I've seen how much these antibiotics cost, plus the time of getting the animals up to treat them. And anytime we're talking about animals intended for food, we've also got to worry about the residues in the meat. Make sure we are being super cautious that we follow the withdrawal times, right? If we use the same antibiotics over and over in our herd, at some point our herd may become resistant to the antibiotics and no longer be effective. And also, if we can prevent these animals from getting sick and not have to use antibiotics in the first place, that opens it up for possibilities of new markets. Right? Consumers are consistently moving towards antibiotic-free or an organically raised products. So if we can get a premium for animals never having antibiotics, that's great. So today, for small farms, we really need to take a practical approach, right? So what is reasonable? Right. So through the past two years, we've all dealt with the COVID-19 pandemic. And luckily, on li livestock, don't have a lot of problems with COVID-19. But as we look at a herd or a flock of animals, I have a hard time getting cattle to wear a mask or getting sheep to say, stay six feet apart at all times. Right? Their nature wants them to be together as a group. But we can control the movement and commingling of animals. We can control what animals are brought in and what animals are taken out. And we can understand what are the most common diseases and then use that understanding to prevent them from ever getting introduced in the first place. So let's talk about some of the routes of transmission. First of all, vectors. Vectors are living things that transmit, transmit diseases from one animal to another, right? So classically, we think of horse flies. A horse fly bites one animal, right? Sucks blood, gets infected, and then the next animal they bite, they give that disease to, right? Fomites are very similar, except they're inanimate objects. Right, so this would be your halters, dehorners, water buckets, dirty needles. Direct contact. Direct contact are diseases that are spread, right, from one animal directly to the other. Right, examples of this would be things like ringworm. Right? And this will also include all of the sexually transmitted diseases. Right. Oral transmission, 
you guessed it, right? This is when something is swallowed. So with most of our parasites, right, they're all fecal oral transmission, right? But anytime an animal ingests a pathogen by consuming feces, urine, saliva of another animal, right? And aerosol, aerosol, this is the hardest to control, right? And what we're sick of hearing about after the last two years. But aerosol can be some of the most contagious types of pathogens. And I use this picture of a spray paint can, right? So imagine that spray paint nozzle, right, as being someone exhaling or an animal exhaling, right? It spreads and disperses as it leaves their mouth. So this is typically our respiratory viruses, right? Those small droplets of mucus that contain the pathogen, once they come out of the mouth, they'll spread. And anything breathing in within a certain distance then can become infected by inhaling, right? So one thing I always mention is fence line contact. You, if you have one single fence, in between two animals, right? The fence doesn't stop the spray paint or those aerosol droplets, right? So for any disease that could be transmitted through aerosol methods, right? Having two fences in between, so they, the two animals can't be nose to nose through the fence. So what are some management things that we can do? So having animals that are going to be resistant to diseases in general or more resistant to diseases, right? So that's great. So having a sound nutritional program in your herd or flock is going to be vital to keeping animals healthy, right? The immune system depends on adequate nutrition, not just of proteins and fats, but also adequate mineral levels. We're going to minimize stress. Anytime an animal becomes stressed, right, their immune system is going to suffer. Right? We're going to vaccinate when we can. There's not a vaccine for every disease out there. But if there is a vaccine and the vaccine is cheap, let's do it. Right? And there are a few diseases where you can actually have genetic resistance in the animal. Next, we're going to make sure that we buy from reputable sources, right? So, you know, what they say, when things sound too good to be true, a lot of times they are, right? So I know, like, my dad, you know, he likes to go through Craigslist and I'll be like, look how cheap this animal is, right? But is there a reason it's that cheap? We've got to ask ourselves these questions. Know where the animal's coming from, right? Know its history. When you go to a stockyards and you buy a calf, right, sometimes it's, you know, great, right? We don't know where that calf came from. But just the process of being in the stockyards itself, even if the animal was completely healthy when it got there, it has been stressed as it's been moved up and down the aisles, right? It's been exposed to hundreds of other animals, right, which sets it up perfectly to get sick once you get it home. Right? Quarantining, right? I don't know if anyone on here watching had COVID, right? But you had to go through that quarantine and you weren't even allowed to go to the grocery store, right? So for when we bring a new animal in, right, the recommended quarantine for livestock is at least 14 days, right? Because when you get exposed to an illness, you don't get sick that day. There's usually several days in between. So if this calf was exposed while it was at the stockyards and you brought it directly home, that 14 days gives you time to see, is it gonna get sick, right? So we wanna keep it completely isolated. And remember those aerosol droplets, there needs to be at least two fences between it and the nearest other animal. We want to keep it somewhere where we can monitor it, 
right? Because if it does get sick, we're gonna need to treat it. So you don't want it on the opposite end of the farm as your working facilities, right? Because then if it does get sick, you're gonna have to drive it all the way through the farm to get it where you can take care of it, right? And let's think about the location. Avoid locations where water runoff is going to go into the other pastures. So you don't want to have a quarantine pen that's going to sit up on the hill where all of their urine, all the water runoff is going to run directly into the path of other animals. Right? Vaccines, I won't spend a whole lot of time on this, right? But if there's a vaccine available and it's cheap, you know, let's take advantage of that. If losing one calf is losing $850, right, that $2 vaccine is looking really good. So minimizing vectors. If we know that pink eye is transmitted by flies, well, why don't we decrease the flies, right? And that decreases the chance that they're gonna be exposed. The movement of animals, avoid co-mingling, right? As much as possible, leave the animals that they're already with and already used to with the same animals. Right? Show animals, right? So I showed cattle when I was younger, right? Whenever you bring those animals home from a show, they could have been exposed while they were out on the road. So we're not gonna put them with the rest of the herd. Show animals need to be kept completely separate than your breeding stock. Right. And the flow of movement of people. You said, when you have an animal that's sick, right, you treat it, you leave it at the barn, you know, the next day when you go to feed, you've thought about it all night, you're wondering how it's doing. It needs to be the last animal you touch that day. So as we care for animals and we start taking care of them, right, we're gonna take care of the healthy animals first, right? We don't wanna go treat and touch the sick animals and then take those germs or those pathogens to the healthy animals. So the flow of movement of people, right? When you go to feed, you're gonna feed the young healthy animals first and then the older healthy animals and then, lastly, you'll go treat the sick animals. Okay. Equipment and vehicles, right? This is stuff that we don't think about very often. If you have multiple locations to your farm, right? If you've got, you know, X number of acres here and then up the road is grandma's old place, right? For each location, have its own set of equipment, whether it be hoof trimmers, water buckets, and don't move that equipment from one farm to the other. That way, if you do have a disease outbreak on one of the farms, you've at least kept it away from the other location. Okay. Vehicles, like I said, movement from one farm to the other. Avoid parking and runoff. Okay. So if you have an area where manure collects, right, or water collects, that's not somewhere where you want to park your truck. Always think about the wheel wells. You've seen as you've drove through mud where the, where the water splashes. Like I said, it's right in those wheel wells, right? Clean those as often as possible, or if you have been on another farm, clean those before driving onto your farm, right? And don't be a vector yourself. Right? Prevent sharing equipment. Right? So, you know, when you're filling up water buckets, what do you do? You stick the water hose down in the bucket, right, so it doesn't splash you. Well, if you stick the water hose into the bucket of an animal that's sick, you get all that mucus, all those respiratory secretions on your water hose. And then you take that same water hose and stick it into the bucket of five other animals you can very quickly see how these viruses could spread. Limit items carried, right? Cell phones, cell phones are the big ones, right? So any ladies out there, right, when you go, you guys have gone into restrooms, right, and you take your phone out of your back pocket because you don't want it to fall, 
right? And then you go wash your hands for two minutes and then pick up that same cell phone, right? How many of you guys are sanitizing your phones? Anytime that you can, leave your keys, watches, jewelry, cell phone, leave it in the truck, right? That will prevent you from taking <laughs> viruses from one location to another as well. You know, there are intense operations that, especially in poultry and swine, that are shower in, shower out. Now, that may not be practical for most of us small farms, but we can do the small things, right? Wear gloves, right, if you're touching something that's sick before you touch an animal that's not. Wear coveralls, and that way if you get something on your coveralls, you can wash them, right? When I was in practice, and I treated sick animals all day, I had a separate pair of boots for my house, right? because I knew that the other boots were around sick animals. Right? So having two sets of boots, one for my farm, one for somebody else's farm. Right? And anytime you can use something that's disposable, as long as it's economically um, affordable, um, do that because that prevents reuse or just the potential of spreading. Right? And develop a biosecurity plan. This is going to be different for each farm. Right? Reach out to your resources, whether this be your county extension agent, specialist at either University of Kentucky or Kentucky State University, your local herd veterinarian. We all want to help you succeed. So reach out to us and we can help you develop a plan specific for your farm. And then make sure that all employees and yourself follow that plan, right? Mistakes get made when we get into a hurry, right? And don't forget, just because you haven't had a disease before doesn't mean that you won't. So I want to thank you guys for coming today. Um, this has been a great presentation or a series of presentations. And if there's anything you need, feel free to reach out to us.